Shoreline Church uh, defines outreach as what we do outside the church. This is what we do in, in the street. This is what we do in our neighborhoods. This is what we do in our schools. It's really about us reaching those who are not within the church, those who don't know Jesus. Um, it, it goes into more formalized programs where we go out into the community and we, we help feed the homeless. We provide clothing for folks who are having a difficult time financially. Uh, that's one way of doing outreach, but along with that, uh, sharing the gospel, sharing the love of Christ as we're doing that. It also goes beyond that. It goes to, you know, that's our Jerusalem. That's our surrounding area, but it goes into the region, the Judea, and out to the ends of the earth where you know, we're doing mission work in, in India. Uh, we're doing mission work in Guatemala where we're going to places that uh, perhaps it's a little more challenging for the word of the gospel to get out. Um, but that's where we're going. We're taking care of their physical needs, but at the same time using that opportunity and that contact to be able to take care of their spiritual needs as well. So for us, it's, it's around the world, it's around the country, it's around our neighborhood, it's in every interaction that we have. That's what outreach is here at Shoreline. God cares about outreach so much because he loves his creation. He loves his people. And for some reason, God has chosen to use us, those who know Jesus. He's chosen to use us, Shoreline Community Church, and he's just chosen to use us, the greater church, to be his voice in this world. And he knows that through his people, through our voices and through our actions, people in this world can come to know him. He loves his creation and he wants to spend eternity with them. When a person, be it a child, a woman, or a man, when a person comes to the cross and receives Jesus Christ, confesses their sins and receives his forgiveness, his love, his grace, enters a relationship with Jesus, we become part of his church. Which means if you've received Jesus Christ, you're part of the church. And if you aren't yet a Christian and you become a Christian, you follow Jesus, you might say, I'm kind of on my own, but God says, no, you're not, you're part of the church. And we ask the question, well, why does the church exist? Which is really another way of saying, why do I exist? If I'm part of the church and the church has a mission, that becomes my mission. And the church really exists for three things. That's what we're talking about, these three things. Number one, the church exists to go upward, to glorify God, to lift him up, to give him praise and glory, and to exalt him and to lift up his name. Someone say amen. I mean, we exist to glorify God. But we also exist to go inward to move towards each other in community and to move towards Jesus to grow in spiritual maturity. There's this inward journey of spiritual growth that we are supposed to be on. And Jesus isn't just the one who saved us from all of our wrongs and all of our sins. He's also our leader, the Lord. And we're becoming more like him. Together, we walk closer to Jesus and become more like him. So we exist to go upward in worship, inward in discipleship and spiritual growth. But the church also exists. And this is the one that most churches miss. Locally, nationally, and globally, most churches miss this, we exist to go outward, to bring the love of Jesus to the ends of the earth and to our next door neighbors. Now, I want you to imagine something. I want you to imagine at the end of the service today, you take out your phone, and you turn it on because, uh, you know, and, and you check your texts, in which you haven't checked all service long, uh, and so you check your texts. <laughs> And you find that you have like four times more texts than you would normally have in an hour's time when you had your phone. You're like, man, I got all these texts. You start looking at them, and they all have these links. You got to watch this. This is crazy. This is insane. I can't believe this. You got to see this. And so, so you, you hit the first link, and it pops open a little video. And it's obviously have somebody's camera on their phone, and it's just a video. You look at it, and you're just watching, and it's this guy sitting by a pool, just with a cold drink, feet in the water, just, and he's kind of having a sip, and you're thinking, why did, they, why did they send me this video? And then the camera pans away from the guy to the middle of the pool. And there's somebody flailing and screaming help and drowning. And here this guy sits, just, just sipping his drink and watching. Not yelling help, not throwing a, a life ring, not jumping in the water, I mean, nothing. No concern, no engagement. You're thinking, this is outrageous, this is insane. So you click the next link, and it's the same thing. And the next link, and, and you find there's three different videos floating around, these viral videos. Of, so this, you're thinking, this can't be true, but three different people have filmed this guy sitting there doing nothing, and then it hits you. The three people who filmed this are filming somebody drowning and somebody doing nothing, and instead of them jumping in the water and putting down their phone, they're just filming it. 
You think there's at least four people around that pool doing nothing while this person looks like they're drowning. You think that just couldn't happen. But what God says is, every person on this planet that doesn't yet know the greatness of God's love and the presence of Jesus and hasn't been filled with the Holy Spirit, it's like they're drowning. It's, it's, like they're, it's like they're a sheep without a shepherd wandering towards a cliff that they're going to fall off. And the word of God says that we're called to jump in the water and save them, to get that lost sheep. Jesus puts it this way. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter, uh, Luke chapter 15. And Jesus tells these three stories. I'll read just one of them. In Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 3, we read these words. Then Jesus told them this, this parable. He told them this story. He said, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? I mean, all out search, find that lost sheep. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. I love that picture. And he goes home and he calls his friends and his neighbors together and he says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. And then Jesus says, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And Jesus isn't saying that most people don't need him. What he's saying is when there's still one lost, one drowning, one wandering, it, it's absolutely the call of people to do something to throw a lifeline, to share a story, to share, uh, to share who Jesus is and what he did and the hope of eternity that's found in Jesus Christ. This is the call outward. It's a call to go out into our own home, our own family, our own neighborhood, our workplace, our school, our community, our nation, our world, and share the love of Jesus. I, I have the privilege and the responsibility of traveling all over the world, working with churches and leaders, trying to help churches do the one thing of those three things that most churches don't do. Almost every church we work with through Organic Outreach International is going upward and they're giving God where they meet every week for worship, they do worship. Almost every church is trying to get believers to grow in their faith. Most churches globally and most churches in the states that we work with say the hardest thing for us is to get people to actually go outward and share the love of Jesus. But that's the call of the church. So here's the question. Why focus outward? Why would we focus outward? Here's, here's the first thing. Number one, because people are lost without Jesus. This is what the Bible teaches. I've heard people say, I don't like that word lost. Well, Jesus uses it. He talks about a lost sheep, a lost coin, a lost son, and going to find that which is lost out of love. And, and, and so why focus outward? Because the people are lost without Jesus, and we who have him should share him. Number two, why focus outward? Because Jesus is on a mission and invites us to join him. We don't go on this mission to the world by ourselves or just with other Christians. We go in the power of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, and filled with the Holy Spirit of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Jesus said, I will be with you always, even till the end of the age. Jesus says, after he's raised from the dead, before he goes back to heaven, he says, I'm gonna send you out, but I'm with you. So we go on mission with Jesus. Why focus outward? Number three, because this is what followers of Jesus do. Christians through all time, in all places, that have been faithful to what this book says, and faithful to Jesus, we go out with his good news and his grace. Why? Here's one more reason. Because God has put you exactly where you are and made you exactly who you are for the sake of the gospel. Do you believe that? That God has put you places that are exactly the right place. And you're like, well, I don't know if I like the job I'm in. I don't, like, I don't know if I like the neighborhood I'm in. Guess what? For right now, God has you there. And he rules the universe. And not only has he put you there, he's put you there because of who you are. There are people that God can reach through your love and your hands and your heart and your words that nobody else is going to be able to reach. You're there on a mission. Believe that and respond to it and share his love. So here's the next question we should ask. When do we focus outward? When's the right time to focus outward? In Luke chapter 19, we have this wonderful story. It begins in verse 1. We read this. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. So Jesus is traveling through. And a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. If you don't know what that means, in those days, he was somebody who robbed his own people and robbed everyone, very corrupt and very hated by almost everyone in that time, in that culture. And he wanted to see who Jesus was. He was compelled and drawn to Jesus. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead, climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him. Since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached that spot, 
he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Rabbis didn't go in the houses of sinners. But Jesus knew that this was a lost sheep up in this tree. And he stopped to help. When do we focus outward? Number one, when we are in the flow of life. Just every day, all the time. When you're on your school campus, when you're workplace, in your neighborhood, you're on the golf course, or on the tennis court, when you're out just being with friends, it might be a moment that God opens the door, be ready. You might just be sitting there and all of a sudden there's somebody drowning and there's a chance to throw them a life ring, to talk with them about Jesus, to say a prayer for them, to care for them, to serve them. When do we focus outward? On special mission trips. We send teams every year to different parts of our country and the globe to partner with people to help them share the love of Jesus. That's a great time to do it. When do we focus outward? When the door is wide open. When somebody's drowning saying, help! That's a great time. But we should be ready and prepared at that moment to know what to say and how to say it in the best way possible. When do we focus outward? With every breath. With every breath of our life is a chance to pray for someone, to love someone, because there's lost sheep all over the place. I was a lost sheep. You were a lost sheep. Or you might still be a lost sheep today until you come to Jesus. We're lost sheep. When do we focus outward? Let me give you a bonus one if you're a note taker writing these things down. Write this down. We focus outward at Shoreline when we give to the work of the church. I know few churches on the planet that, do, that, that have leveraged every single ministry and everything we do, not just to go upward and inward, but everything we do, we say, how do we reach out with the love of Jesus? And right now we have somewhere between 30 and 40,000 churches globally that are actually learning from Shoreline right now. You're going to hear some more about that later. But we literally have churches all over the world that we're trying to help them because these are churches that are worshiping God, they're growing in faith, but they don't know quite how to reach out and we're coming alongside of them and helping them. And in many cases around the world, we can afford to do that because of your generosity. When you give to Shoreland, it's not just for what happens in this room or on this campus, it impacts the world. And you're gonna hear more of that story today. Well, where do we focus outward? You know, where's the right place to be reaching out? And I'm going to read a passage that Pastor Keith's going to read in just a moment and talk about. But, but listen to this, what Jesus says. Now, Christ is risen from the dead before he's ascended to heaven. And he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and the Spirit has come. And you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So where do we focus outward? And here's the answer. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. Well, what's that mean? I'll give you just a snapshot. In the ancient world, when they heard that, Jerusalem was their hometown, right where they lived, right where they were comfortable, right where you, God's put you, and you're kind of every single day, that's Jerusalem. Judea was the broader community. Monterey, Salinas, if you're here visiting from another part of the country, right, your broader community, you're supposed to reach out there. Samaria, you know what that was back in those days, the people Jesus was talking to? The people they didn't like and the place they avoided. They would literally travel around that part of the neighborhood. They didn't want to relate with those people. Jesus said, no, you're going to go there. And bring my love because there's lost sheep there. And the ends of the earth. And that means wherever God sends you. That's where we go and focus outward. And then the last question that I want to ask is how can we go outward? How do we do it? Well, 1 Peter 3.15 says this. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Now listen to this. This is for every Christian. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. That's the hope of Jesus. Be ready to give an answer to explain your faith. And I love this. But do this with gentleness and respect. Don't be overbearing. Don't be mouthy. Don't be in your face. Be gentle. Be respectful. But always ready to share about your faith. So how can we go outward more? Here's the first thing. See each day as a mission trip. You wake up in the morning. Say, okay, God, it's an adventure today. I may not be getting on a plane and going somewhere, but I'm getting in my car or my bike or walking somewhere, and wherever I go, it's a chance to be on a mission trip. God, I'm available. Send me, use me, prepare me. And if you see every day that way, God will open doors. And when he does, you can walk through them and share God's love and pray for people and serve people and share the story of Jesus. Every day is a mission trip. How can we go outward more? We can see people the way Jesus does. Say, God, let me see people the way you do. They may look like they have it all together and they may look like they're all kind of tidied up and everything's all straightened out in their life. But Jesus says, man, that's a lost sheep heading for a cliff. 
Jesus, let me see her the way you see her. Let me see him the way you see him. And then let me love them, Jesus, the way you do. And you'll see people differently. You pray that prayer, God will start to open your eyes and your heart to the needs that people have, and that need can be satisfied in Jesus. How can we go outward more? Here's the third thing. Be prepared, trained, and resourced. Be prepared, be trained, be resourced, be ready. That's why we as a church do training regularly of youth, of adults, of children. We want to train people to share their faith. That's why every year we do a training event here, which I think is like a premier training event on the planet. And get this, we are bringing in to Shoreline, this is right here on my little flyer here, Saturday, March 23rd from 9 to 3.30, a guy named Mark Middleberg, probably one of the brightest minds in the Christian world in helping people know how to answer the really hard questions people are asking Christians these days. And people are asking hard questions. And we've got probably five to 6,000 people just at Shoreline that can sign up for this. You know how many we have so far? At last I asked, 75. And when I heard that, I just thought, I thought, Lord, we're not taking the time to get prepared. So can I, can I be your pastor for a minute? Can I challenge you? Give me an amen, somebody. Amen. That's pretty good. Okay, thank you. All. Since you asked. Um, if you can cancel whatever you have on Saturday, March 23rd, and be here for this training, it will prepare you and equip you to share your faith for tough questions that are coming your way or that you already have. You can register online. You can register in the, in the, in the connection center over there. But, but, and if you can't afford it, it's 40 bucks. That's our cost. We're not making money on it. It's 40 bucks. If you can't afford it, you come anyways. We'll cover the cost. You know why? Because people at Shoreline are generous, and we always figure it out. We're not going to say you can't come, but we want you to be here if you can be here on that Saturday. So I just want to challenge you to be there. I want to give you one more challenge, just a simple way to reach out. If there's somebody you've been thinking about inviting to church for weeks or months or years and you never got around to it, starting next week for three weeks is going to be the best time in like the last couple of years you can invite a non-church, non-Christian friend to church. Because I'm going to be doing a three-week series on a book that's all about just normal daily life. It's basically helping people learn how to say no to the okay things or bad things or good things so they can say yes to what God says matters most and to get their lives together. And you can say, and, and you can actually, and I, and I never do this, and, I, and I'm cautious to do this, but I want to do it. We got copies of this book that this is the series is based on. It's called No is a Beautiful Word, Hope and Help for the Overcommitted and Occasionally Exhausted. All right? We got copies for $7, which are at cost because I'm the author, and I'm getting no count. It doesn't count as sales, and it doesn't count. I get no profit. I don't get a penny off these things. I'm telling you. We bought them for the cost of the publisher so we can sell them to you for that so you can give them to a non-church friend and say, hey, you ought to read this book. And by the way, the author is preaching at our church the next three weeks because he's our pastor. Um, and when we run out of them, we run out of them. But that, that, that is literally the cost with tax and shipping and the books. And I get, I, get, I get no credit for sales. I get no money off it, okay? If I was doing that, I wouldn't share it with you. But I, I, I want you to know, this is not for me. This is, I want you to reach out to someone that doesn't know Jesus and invite them to church. The next three weeks would be the best time to do it. And so we want to kind of open this up and talk about what this looks like. And so I want to ask Pastor Keith to come here and share a little bit. And I can tell you, as Pastor Keith comes up, when Pastor Keith first came to Shoreline Church, he was a lost sheep. He was in the pool drowning. He didn't know Jesus. He was searching. He was seeking. He came to Shoreline Church, and because people like you loved him and served him and gave and built a church like this church, he came to faith in Jesus. Then he started to volunteer at the church. Then he started to be on staff at church. Then he became a pastor at church, and now he's an executive pastor helping oversee all of our outreach and operations. This guy rocks. Please welcome him. He's going to share stuff with you. Keith. Thank you. <laughs> Really, this church means a lot to me because this is where my life here and now in my eternity was forever changed. Shoreline exists for one reason, and it's to help as many people as possible become totally committed to Jesus Christ. This is our mission statement. And I want to look at that in, in light of Acts 1a that Pastor Kevin read earlier, which is, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When we look at our mission statement to help as many people as possible become totally committed to Jesus Christ, and then we look at Acts 1.8, it's really easy, I think, for us to say, so Shoreline staff and Shoreline pastors exist to help as many people as possible become totally committed to Jesus Christ. I think it's easy to look at a church and say that's what that organization is about. But let's read Acts 1.8. Eight again. It says, but you 
will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We can't pass over that word you, because it really is about you. Now the church staff, the, the church pastors aren't stepping aside and saying, okay, it's not on us. But when we talk about us as a church, we're talking about you, and we're talking about me. Each and every one of us here has a part in being a witness for God. So it is our call as a church and it is our call as individuals to be God's witnesses in this world. So how does Shoreline go outward? The reality is that Shoreline goes outward through every ministry in our church, from our smallest infants to our adult ministries, our middle school, our high school, throughout this church. But today we're talking about our outreach division. And our outreach division is, is actually made up of operations and outreach. And our operations is our human resources, it is our finances, it's our facilities, it's our custodial, it's our safety, it's our security. This operations ministry may not sound like they're too much about outreach, but the reality is that our operations allows all of the ministries here to, to happen, and that our operations supports all of the ministries here, and we work closely with our outreach ministry. But our outreach here, again, goes throughout the world to share Jesus with this world. And we have two kind of main ways that we do this, and the first one is global outreach. And that is where we read in Acts 1-8, to the ends of the earth. Our global outreach is exactly that. We have partnerships. We do, we do short-term missions trips, but they're really not about the trip. They're really about our partnership. We have partnerships in, in Mexico, in Guatemala, in India, and we're currently even looking into a partnership in Nigeria. But these partnerships about, are about us working with people who are in the country. You see, too often with missions trips, you go in, you do some quick project, and then you leave. And then there's no one there to continue the work. But we've, we've seen that if we develop partnerships, that we have ongoing work taking place long after we leave. In Mexico, we... We partner with orphanages, we, we partner with homeless ministries, we, we come and feed people and we clothe people and we share Jesus with people. We have partnership in, in Guatemala with uh, uh, Iglesia Galileo in San Lucas where we actually went there and helped build the church. We went there and we built houses and we built outdoor stoves so that people could, could have the physical needs that they needed. But at the same time, we, we helped equip a church so that they can share Jesus on an ongoing basis. We have a partnership in Vishakapatnam, India. And in this place, there's, a, there's housing and there's a school. Currently, there's 20 kids living there with capacity for 200 kids to be there. There's capacity for 600 kids to be in the school. They have a dairy there, and, and the growing dairies is helping finance the ministry that's going on there. So Shoreline Church, are we running a uh, dairy in India? No. We're helping. We're, we're partnering. We're, we're working with the people there, and you're going to hear a little bit more about that ministry in just a little bit. And they do church planning in remote tribal areas. They do so much work there, and we come alongside them. That's how we are witnesses to the ends of the earth. And so as, as we give to the church, as Pastor Kevin said, or as we go on short-term missions trips to these places, you have an opportunity to truly be God's witnesses to the ends of the earth through these partnerships. And we also reach this world locally through community outreach. Currently, we have over 30 ministries that fall under community outreach. And if I just listed them right now, it would take up all of my time. But I pulled out just a few that I want to talk about today because I think it's so important. We feed the homeless. We partner with Dorothy's Place in Salinas. And we go to Salinas on a monthly basis and we offer food to those who are hungry. But the truth is the food we give them is just the smallest portion of our time. Because really if we fed them and then left, 
They'd be full for a few moments, but then would be hungry again. But the fact of the matter is that we use this service opportunity to get an audience with people who don't know Jesus. And while we share food with them, even more importantly, we have the opportunity to share Jesus with them. Right here in our backyard, we have a food pantry in a clothes closet. You'll, you'll see it out there. It's called the back porch. And in the month of January alone, we served 436 people in 142 households through our food pantry and our clothes closet. That's 436 people who came onto our campus and were served because of you. Now, there were people that were there personally, and then there was your financial giving. There's room for more people to be there personally, and there's room for more people to give financially. But you have an opportunity to share Jesus with people through that ministry. We offer each and every person food. We offer them clothing. And we offer them the hope that is possible through a relationship with Jesus. We had 22 people who were offered prayer and accepted See, this is through this ministry that we're able to meet not only physical needs, but we're able to meet spiritual needs as well. We partner with iHelp and for women where we serve dinner and we give encouragement and we help women who are in a transition home for homelessness. We have women's shelter visits where we do the same thing. We have our heart-to-home ministry where we collect donated goods, furnishings for homes, and we give them to those who are transitioning from one of these shelters into a permanent home. There are so many opportunities. Just I listed five, but we have 25-plus more opportunities for you to get involved in our ministries here that help bring hope and bring Jesus to this lost world. I'm truly thankful for this church, not only for the impact that you've had on me personally, but the impact that you're having on this world. And I want to pray, and I want to ask God to continue and to increase the work that he's doing through you, through our staff, and through Shoreline Community Church. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that in your wisdom you have chosen to use your people to be your witnesses in this world. I thank you for each and every person you've brought here and that you've used at Shoreline. And I pray you would use us in ever-increasing measure. Those who are currently serving in these ministries, Lord, I pray that you would encourage them and you would empower them, that you would strengthen them. And for those who have not yet said yes, Father, would you stir in them a desire to not only go upward and inward, but to go outward through our ministries here. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank Keith for his passionate leadership, yeah. Well, as we were launching Organic Outreach International, this ministry that's now resourcing churches all over the world, I didn't know that while we were launching this and getting ready to get started that God would call Walt Bennett, who has a background in the military, a background in building furniture, and then most recently for many years in the insurance world with a very nice job in the business world. But God called him to set all that aside and to become a pastor at Shoreline to lead Organic Outreach International. And he has with him Sadir, who is our partner in India. And so will you welcome Walt and Sadir as they share with you. So what if we were to take this passion, this vision, this clear biblical vision of helping as many people as possible become totally committed to Jesus Christ and got it outside the boundaries of this church, outside the, this geography and, and around the world in ways that multiply the impact that we can have on those who are lost to, by tens, by hundreds, exponentially. That's what we do with Organic Outreach International. So about eight years ago, shortly after Kevin came on board, we started doing organic outreach conferences here at Shoreline. By we, I mean us, all of us. And, and these conferences grew over the years. It was two and a half days every year. We invited people in, started around the region, got bigger around the country. People came in, around the world people came in. And, and these conferences grew every year. And, and we got to the point that, that there was so much demand for teaching and coaching beyond these two days every year that you, Shoreline, said we need to start a ministry to deal with this full time, year round, to help churches and denominations figure out how do they change the culture of their church 
to be reaching out with the gospel in every opportunity that they have. So in 2016, we started Organic Outreach International. Since then, we've trained thousands of pastors and denominational leaders. We're now working directly with people in, in eight different countries around the world. We're continuing to grow that. We're working with six different denominations. This is denominationally agnostic. It's an odd combination of words. Denominationally agnostic. It works with any Bible-believing denomination. And that's what we're doing through Organic Outreach. Monthly coaching, we're training uh, in trainings around the country and around the world. And, and the best way to explain kind of the transformation that's happening from this is to, to actually hear from our partner in India. Sudhir's come over. He's going to be here for about a month visiting here. Um, but they work with a, a partner ministry. And as, as Keith has pointed out, we raise up leaders. And Sudhir is our leader for Organic Outreach International in Vishakhapatnam, India. So Sudhir, share with us a little bit about what's happening over there. Greetings. I bring greetings from India, my family in India and the church in India. It's a privilege to be here today and uh, to be a part of this wonderful service. Uh, India is a country of diversity with uh, one-fifth of the world population. Um, there are 1.2 billion people who are yet to receive Christ. 1.2 billion. And the need is so huge. But the, when I say this, I'm not saying that we lack an effort. The church love, want to reach out to these people, but somehow we have struggled to reach out to our friends, our families, our neighbors, and the country as a whole. The reason is maybe uh, we, have be, we, have, we have been uh, reaching out to the people in patterns that we have been used to. Uh, evangelism is about open-air meetings. Evangelism is about, I mean, megaphones. Evangelism is about crusades. And sometimes it is a big show uh, sort of things that happen. And, you know, somehow we fail to bring in those people outside the church. Every time we do this, it is all about the people who are Christian, who come to these uh, uh, meetings and all of that. But, and I want to say, like, uh, when I came here a couple of years ago to be a part of this intensive training, and you know, all my life as a pastor, I was just thinking we have failed somewhere, we are missing something, but when I came here, I found that missing key. Today, I found why we are not able to reach out to India, and what I have been learning here, and I took it back to India, and partnering with Walt and uh, the team at Organic Outreach, it was such a blessing that I, we could go back to India. In the last two years, we could train 350 pastors. And today, they're training Christians of how to be able to reach out to people. It's a blessing. And I want to tell you, and I want to tell you like, this is, this is an amazing thing that we, we know what is happening. And you know, like, if it is not for this way of doing the gospel, I would have not been a pastor. My dad, who was an orphan, raised up in an orphanage. He grew up with a, with a desire to take care of orphans. But you know, somehow he lost his way. He became an abusive father, an abusive husband, until one man who took the responsibility on him, came to him, and uh, constantly reaching out to him, building a relationship, and in the process, brought him to Christ. And you know, like, not just him, but the change that happened in his life changed my mom. And you know, like, and since then, it has been 20 years what my dad has left, taking care of orphans. He's came back to that place. And the last 25 years, he's taken care of numerous, hundreds of orphans today who have a hope to live on. And it's a blessing. And I want to say the small things that you do, as I thank Shoreline for everything that you have been doing. And I thank Pastor Kevin and all the team at Organic Outreach that the work that they do has blessed us. And today we take churches are being transformed, people's lives are being transformed. And I believe like there will be amazing things that we are going to see in the future. And thank you so much for having me here. Thank you, brother. Heavenly Father, we lift up Sudhir, we lift up the ministry that they have there, the orphanage and the school and the church and, and all the pastors that they're working with and all of our partners globally that we're working with. Father, just bless their efforts, bless their heart for you and for, for reaching the lost. And, and Father, just praise for the heart of Shoreline to reach as many people as possible with that saving message of Jesus Christ. We lift this all to you in the precious name of your son. Amen. 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 Yeah. 
And before I, before I uh, pray for these folks and for our outreach and operations team, I want to just encourage you to think about your life and say, where's God put me? Where has God put me? If you've come to Jesus, if you believe in him, say, God, don't let me just sit there and watch lost sheep wander off. Don't let me sit there and watch people that are spiritually flailing and drowning and, and just not throw them a lifeline. If you know Jesus, pray for people, love them, serve them, tell his story. And, and just know that that mission outward is every single day of your life if you're, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. And I want to just challenge you here at Shoreline Church uh, that, that our partnership with Organic Outreach International, we, we minister here, but Shoreline's vision from the very beginning was help as many people as possible become totally committed to Jesus Christ. We had no idea at that time that as many people as possible would be that we would get to train somebody who would train 350 pastors in India. But that's your legacy. I had a pastor kind of corner me and catch me when I was in Kansas City with my wife and I and the whole team training pastors two weeks ago. And this pastor said, I oversee 100 churches. And he said, four years ago, half of our churches didn't see one single person come to faith in Jesus. He said, then we started doing organic outreach and just taking the tools that we're learning from Shoreline for organic outreach. He said, this last year, and he said this totally with just joy in his voice. He said, this last year, 90% of our churches saw people come to faith in Jesus. That's your impact. Yeah, that's your impact. So uh, I want you to look up on the screen here. This is your operations and outreach team here at Shoreline Church. And that's from our HR to our facilities to our, um, to, uh, our finances to our global outreach, community outreach, organic outreach. All of them are part of that. That group is helping us influence between 30 and 40,000 churches globally on your behalf. So let's pray for them. And you can keep your eyes open as you look up there. Lord Jesus, we look at these folks up on the screen who serve so faithfully, some of them right here on this campus, just to keep things running and to keep us above water so we can do all the things you call us to do in our community, our nation, and our world. Will you bless them and fill them? And then for the outreach leaders and organic outreach and community outreach and global outreach and all that we do, would you bless each of them? And we pray a special blessing on Sadir and his ministry and be with his family as he's gone from them right now. And would you just fill him with fresh new thoughts and ideas to go back? And we pray that, that, we pray that in the coming years, he'll, he'll train 3,500 more pastors in how to go out with the gospel. Oh, Jesus, thank you for your love for us and your grace, and we pray that you will meet us in this time. Fill us with your spirit afresh and send us out of here as your missionaries in this world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.